So I would like to kick off by welcoming Chuck Connolly. Um, he's here to speak to us today on why is Iowa so white? Um, I think we're all very excited to hear what he has to say. Um, I am Megan Phillips, your ICFRC co-director and host for today's program. As always, we thank our members, supporters, and interns for making these forums possible. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa's honors program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. I also thank City Channel 4 and the UI Digital Libraries for helping us continue to make our programs available to online audiences. Today, we will have another exciting online program and following our speaker's presentation at about one o'clock, we will have a 15 minute Q&A. Please submit your questions via the chat function, um, which you can do below at the bottom of your Zoom screen, the chat um, shaped icon. And for those of you watching on Facebook, you can submit your questions via comment and we will do our best to monitor those as well. As a final reminder, I ask as people are joining that you keep your audio and video turned off for the duration of the presentation and do not interrupt the speaker. Um, and with that, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Chuck Connerly. So Chuck Connerly joined the University of Iowa School of Urban and Regional Planning in 2008 as professor and director. His research has been published in top journals on urban planning. He wrote the most segregated city in America City Planning and Civil Rights in Birmingham, 1920 through 1980, and co-edited Growth Management in Florida, Planning for Paradise, published by Ashgate Publishing in 2007. His recent book, Green, Fair, and Prosperous, Paths to a Sustainable Iowa, is an assessment of Iowa's sustainability challenges and responses. It builds on Connorsley's work with Community Engagement Initiative, of which he is the principal founder, the UI Iowa Initiative for Sustainable Communities. In 2015, he received the Michael J. Brody Award for Faculty Service presented by the University of Iowa Faculty Senate and the UI Provost Office. In 2018, he was presented with the J. Chatterjee Award for Service by the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning. So please join me in welcoming Chuck Connerly. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Chuck. All right, thank you very much. So now I want to share my screen, right? Yep, and you should be able to do that, I believe. Okay. All right. And so can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. It's not, uh, hang on. There, now it's bigger. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, Megan, very much. This is an honor. I've, the irony, of course, is that uh, I'm a member of the uh, Congregational Church, uh, and normally these meetings take place in the basement. And uh, so we all long to be in the basement, I suppose, of uh, Congregational United Church of uh, Iowa City. So uh, my talk is on, uh, has the, I think, provocative title, Why is Iowa so white? Uh, and uh, it's, uh, this is a chapter actually in, a, in the book that uh, Megan just mentioned that has just been published uh, last week by the University of Iowa Press, uh, Green, Fair and Prosperous, Paths to a Sustainable Iowa. And, and in that book, I look at various aspects of sustainability, environmental sustainability certainly being one of them, but also looking at issues of uh, both uh, Iowa's economy, particularly as it relates to, uh, to employment and jobs, and how that's transformed, and then uh, social justice and social equity issues. That, so those constitute or comprise the three E's, uh, environment, equity, uh, and economic development uh, that are discussed in the book. So uh, if, if you're interested, uh, please feel free. We don't have any books here to sell, but uh, they are available at Prairie Lights and by the University, I mean, uh, by uh, the University of Iowa Press. Okay, uh, this is a, a, a picture from an article that was in The Economist uh, this summer. Uh, and it sort of, says, sort of says something about the connection between this topic, about, which is about Iowa, and the globe and the world. Uh, and, uh, and identifies uh, the Midwest as a region, quote, a region with, with outsized punch. And we know, you know one of the principal reasons for that is uh, the election coming up and the importance of that election to the world, 
uh, and uh, everybody's eyes are on the Midwest, uh, states like Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, if you consider that a Midwestern state, uh, and then Iowa, uh, and certainly the Senate election here in Iowa is, is, is very important. We all see the ads for that. So, uh, and part of that importance is the issue uh, of, of, of race uh, and, and discrimination and racism. Uh, this, of course, is a photograph from uh, uh, 38th, I believe, and Chicago. Uh, in uh, Minneapolis, uh, the intersection where George Floyd was killed uh, earlier uh, this summer. And uh, like Minnesota, Iowa has issues related to racism, uh, similar to Kenosha, Wisconsin as well. And, and while they grab the headlines, the Midwest as a whole uh, has, uh, has had issues and continues to have issues with racism. Some of the most segregated cities in America, most of the segregated cities, most segregated cities in America are in uh, the Midwest. So um, diversity in Iowa. Uh, I've lived in Iowa twice, once in the mid 1960s. Uh, and then after moving here uh, uh, in, in 2008 to, to join the University of, of Iowa. And um, one, as it says here, one can drive through the state or walk through the University of Iowa campuses I have and not see a single uh, uh, Amer African American or Latinx, and unless you are a member of those groups, not think anything of it. Uh, such is diversity. Uh, we are a, and have been for a long time, a predominantly white state. In fact, we are the sixth whitest state. I believe at one time we may have been the whitest state in the US, but as, as we become more diverse, as it says here, uh, we are gradually uh, uh, falling in the, in the standings, if you will. Uh, uh, so as of 2017, we were sixth uh, behind the, uh, uh, the, the three upper New England states were whiter than we were, as well as Montana uh, and, and, and West Virginia. Uh, in 1850, we were 99.8 percent white, uh, and uh, you know, 100 years later or so, when I was an undergraduate at, at Grinnell, uh, the state was still 99 percent uh, white. That's changed dramatically. It's still a predominantly white state, but we can look at the numbers compared 1980 to 2015, and we see that the population of African Americans has more than doubled. Uh, the population of Asians has is, uh, gone up by about seven times. Native Americans has gone up by three times to almost 16,000. And uh, 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 Hispanics have grown most rapidly from about 25,000 to 182,000, somewhere between eight and nine times uh, during that period of time. So uh, a, a, big, uh, a big change, but nevertheless still, we're still the sixth whitest state uh, in uh, the U.S. At the same time, the white population of the state is, uh, is, is uh, uh, growing very slowly. Uh, and uh, between 2000 and 2010, uh, by 1%, while during the same period of time, we see that uh, 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 other, the other groups we've been talking about, Asian, African-American, Asian, Hispanic, have grown uh, quite rapidly. So the white population is barely holding its own. Uh, nevertheless, when you drive through the state or walk on campus, as I said, it still looks pretty darn white. And that's partly because uh, the, uh, the groups we're talking about uh, are tend to be concentrated in relatively few places. Hispanics tend to be concentrated uh, in meatpacking towns um, like Columbus Junction, for example, or Perry, Iowa. Um, and uh, uh, African Americans tend to be concentrated in the bigger cities like Des Moines, Waterloo, uh, or uh, or Iowa City. Uh, so there are many spaces, there are many places where you see relatively few people who are uh, not white. So it still has the appearance of being predominantly a white state. So how did it become a predominantly white state, and really how is it? Why has it remained such a white, a predominantly white state, and how is it doing in terms of the transition? that uh, we're observing. Well, the quick answer in terms of how it became a predominantly white state, I, is, it is not, no surprise, is that European Americans or uh, 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 descendants of, uh, of Europeans were eager for the land. Um, and uh, when the opportunity came, uh, they pretty much uh, took it. 
Uh, the U.S. population was increasing by an astounding 33% every decade between 1790 and 1860. And so the pressure on land uh, grew uh, tremendously. Um, and, uh, and so, um, and, and in effect, uh, Iowa became white because it was U.S. policy. And one of the points that I'm trying to make in this talk is uh, not only was it U.S. policy with regard to Native Americans, but in many respects, it remains U.S. policy uh, or federal policy uh, to uh, maintain uh, Iowa as a predominantly uh, white state. And I'll, I'll provide the evidence for why I think that's true. Uh, it, it, in some respects, it begins with uh, Thomas Jefferson when he was president of the United States. And uh, he wrote the uh, new territorial governor, William Henry Harrison, uh, what he wanted uh, uh, Governor uh, Harrison to do. And uh, Jefferson was concerned about, uh, you know, what he thought was the, what really what he thought was the excessive amount of land that Native Americans uh, uh, had access to. Uh, and that he basically wanted them to, in some way, give up their land. Uh, so he says that uh, Jefferson predicted that when the Indians accumulated debts in their trade with white people, they would be willing to, quote, lop them off by a session of lands. This is in a letter that Jefferson wrote Harrison. Um, in so doing, Jefferson had hoped that Indians would give up their desire for access to extensive forest and vast lands and that they would turn to a small scale agriculture. That's what, that was the, the future that, uh, that uh, uh, Jefferson had for Native Americans. Um, and that pretty much that statement uh, pretty much dictated U.S. policy towards Native Americans, which was to effectively get them uh, out of the way of, of white settlements, certainly the case in Iowa. Uh, one year later, Harrison uh, induced a group of five Sauk and Meskwaki men uh, uh, in t uh, to come to St. Louis to sign a treaty giving up much of what you see right here, Northwest Illinois, along with portions of Wisconsin and uh, Missouri. And, uh, and so, in, for, for, and for probably several decades, this, it, this didn't mean a lot because uh, uh, settlers had not yet arrived, white settlers had not yet arrived in Illinois, for example. Uh, but gradually they would. In the meantime, Iowa was, of course, still a territory. And there were many, many um, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, native tribes in uh, Iowa. This is a map from the state archaeologist offices and shows uh, uh, not the only tribes, many of the, uh, many of the tribes that existed in Iowa at one time or another and the various uh, places that they live, including both the Meskwaki, uh, and uh, the Sauk. Um, and these are maps that show where this, the Sauk and Meskwaki basically sort of cohabitated. Uh, they had separate villages, but they lived near each other and they took care of each other. Uh, and by 1825, uh, the, the Sauk and the Meskwaki had quite a bit of run, of the run uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in what was then still the territory that would become the state of Iowa. Uh, but there were issues, and particularly uh, the uh, uh, what became known as the Black Hawk War, uh, uh, that uh, uh, some have called the Battle for the Heart of America, uh, in which uh, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, it, they, uh, the Sauk and Meskwaki were supposed to be stay, uh, remain on the west side, remove to the west side of the Mississippi River and not come into Illinois, particularly into the Saukanuk, uh village in what is now Rock Island, upset some people, particularly upset Black Hawk. Uh, so he, he denied the Treaty of 1804 that uh, Harrison had promulgated and a follow-up treaty, which even he had signed, uh, and claimed that uh, the Sauk and Meskwak leaders uh, should move back to the east side of the Mississippi River. They would cross the river. And so in spring of 1832, they did exactly that. Black Hawk and about 2,000 uh, individuals uh, crossed the river uh, to return to Saukanuk. Uh, and what began was uh, what was later labeled the Black Hawk War, which lasted the summer of 1832 and ended uh, badly 
uh, Blackhawk survived, he escaped, but uh, uh, ended badly for most of the uh, 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 predominantly Sox on Meskwaki and a massacre that took place in the Mississippi River. Uh, uh, some people call the Battle of Bad Axe, but the Bad Axe Massacre. What that resulted in had not only an impact on Native Americans in Illinois, it basically expelled them, but also on Iowa. So uh, what, what took place after 1832 was a series of land sessions that by 1851 resulted in Native Americans being completely removed. There were, there were, there were some that lingered, but for the most part, they were, had been completely removed from the state of Iowa. And this, this is, of course, what quote unquote freed Iowa up for European settlement. Uh, initially the Black Hawk Purchase of 1832 followed by a series of sessions that pretty much followed the pattern that Jefferson said. Uh, uh, Native Americans would become indebted uh, and uh, uh, they would, uh, and one of the ways in which they needed to pay off their debts, uh, one of the ways in which they could pay off their debts is to, is, is to sell uh, their land. Um, they were also concerned that uh, the, um, uh, they were running out of space in which uh, they, they, there was a sufficient forest for them to do their hunting in and the deer population was declining dur during this time as well. So it was making harder and harder for them to sustain themselves uh, uh, on what was left for them uh, as their land, the land they could occupy was contracted. Uh, we know that uh, part one of, you know, so that's sort of one of the really sad stories of Iowa, of how basically Native Americans were expelled. But Iowa has sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of a good news, bad news state in, in, in all of these stories, basically. Uh, the, the good news was that the Meskwaki were very stubborn people uh, and uh, they wanted to come back. And uh, they ended up buying, they were able to buy uh, 80 acres of land uh, near Tama in Tama County. Uh, and this was, uh, this was a, a uh, they, uh, they were able to do this in part because the governor of Iowa at that time, who was an abolitionist, uh, a name by the name of Grimes, uh, was sympathetic to them and uh, between him and the legislature enabled them, they, they had to pass a law, the legisl legislature had to pass a law to permit uh, 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 Native Americans to move in. So, uh, so the Meskwaki, many of them came back uh, initially with 80 acres, now it's 8,000 acres. And of course they have a casino. Uh, overall, they're doing uh, uh, very well. So there, there was an achievement there, but compared the 8,000 acres versus how many thousands of acres Native Americans occupied before, um, uh, certainly is, is a, it's a stark comparison. So uh, by the 1840s, Native Americans are being pushed out um, and quickly white Iowans turn to uh, African Americans. Um, <clears throat> Iowa is a free state, uh, but next door to Iowa is a slave state, Missouri. And uh, uh, as the numbers show here, the population of African Americans in, uh, in Missouri was going, growing quite rapidly uh, between 1830 and 1860. And um, we know about the Underground Railroad and we know that uh, there were many communities in Iowa that helped facilitate uh, the transfer, the escape uh, and transfer of African Americans from Missouri through uh, uh, Iowa, eventually to, uh, in many cases, to Canada. But uh, the white population was concerned about African Americans moving in. They, 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 uh, they, they were opposed to that. And interesting person in this regard was uh, uh, Ed Langworthy. Uh, he, he was a Dubuque. He was a lead lead mining businessman in. Uh, in, uh, in Dubuque, and he had actually uh, trespassed before 1832. He had trespassed on Meskwaki land uh, in order to gain access to Meskwaki lead mines. After the Black Hawk War, the Meskwaki had to give up those lead mines, so Langworthy benefited from the Meskwaki um, uh, being chased out. And uh, so then he turned his attention to African Americans. And he says in 1844, upon the borders of a slave state, and if we had not something to keep them out, we should have all the broken down Negroes of Missouri overrunning us. So there was pressure being placed by people like Langworthy to keep African Americans uh, out. 
Um, and um, and so, uh, and we'll get to it in just a minute, but the Iowa legislature follows along. So at, this, at the same time, the, uh, there have been some, and, and this really gets to the next chapter of sort of milestones and millstones, what we're proud of and what we're not so proud of. Uh, the pressure to keep African Americans out is something that we're not proud of. What we are proud of is uh, several Supreme Court cases. Uh, the one in the middle on the top is uh, Clark v. Uh, Board, of Edu uh, Board of Directors, uh, which in 1868, after, right after the Civil War, says that uh, school segregation is, uh, is unconstitutional in the state of Iowa. And they, ci they cite the actual Iowa Constitution that said all men are by nature free and equal. Women has been added to that since then. But because of the Iowa Constitution and this uh, uh, Article 1, Number 1, uh, Iowa very early on, I think it was the first state to say that school segregation was unconstitutional. Uh, there were other important uh, Iowa Supreme Court cases as well uh, that illustrated, at least on the judicial side in the 19th century, that Iowa was a, uh, uh, was a, was a progressive state. So there's this progressive impulse, at least as expressed in the courts. Uh, a part of that was Alexander Clark, uh, himself an African-American barber uh, from uh, Muscatine, who uh, 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 attempted in 1855 to repeal a law that had been passed in, uh, in 1851 that would keep African-Americans out of the state. He organized African-American soldiers in, uh, uh, to volunteer for the Union Army. And then in 1868, he was the person that sues Muscatine School District over uh, its attempt to exclude his daughter from attending the public schools. So uh, I mentioned the, the milestones, the millstones that we're not so proud of. Uh, is um, the uh, uh, 18, well, uh, early on, there was a requirement that any African American had to post a bond of, 18, of $500 in order to live in the state. That was 1839. 1851, the Iowa legislature says that uh, African Americans are not allowed to move into the state. Uh, this is not overturned until 1864. Um, and uh, uh, and so we are sort of not so proud of those millstones. Uh, but by 1868, basically with the Republicans, uh, who were the progressive party of that day, uh, obtaining ascendancy uh, in 1868, they pushed for amendments to the state constitution that would assure black civil rights, including suffrage, the right to vote, which at that time was available to blacks in only five other states. The 15th amendment had not yet been uh, adopted. So Iowa was a pioneer in, the, in with regard to suffrage after the Civil War. So things changed dramatically uh, uh, with the ascendancy of the Republican party along with the uh, court decisions. And in fact, President Grant referred to Iowa as a bright radical star uh, it w uh, in his urging to approve the amendments that would permit suffrage for African Americans, and indeed Iowa uh, fulfilled that. And by 1880, the electorate approves uh, a, a motion to allow African Americans to serve in the legislature. Um, so the result was that uh, African Americans do start to move to Iowa. Uh, particularly during the Civil War, but also after the Civil War. These are escaped slaves and uh, also, uh, well, escaped slaves uh, in part behind um, uh, and uh, during the Civil War uh, who were led to the North by, uh, uh, by Union soldiers. And this is a, 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 an engraving uh, depicting exactly that. And my colleague in the History Department, Leslie Schwalm, has wrote, written a wonderful book uh, about this uh, period in which African Americans begin to move into Iowa. But she also talks about uh, the, the still the conflicting notions that exist in Iowa at the time. And she has two quotes here uh, that I want to cite. For those Midwesterners who understand, whose understanding of white supremacy had been, premise, had been premised on their right and ability to exclude first Native Americans and then African Americans from the region, the physical mobility of former slaves suggested an undesirable change in racial boundaries and practices in a post-slavery nation. And even though the Republican Party had affirmed suffrage, the Democratic Party of Iowa continued to have 
uh, a racist agenda. Uh, and, and, and said in 1862, uh, this is the government of white men and was established exclusively for the white race that the Negroes are not entitled to and ought not to be admitted to political or social equality with the white race. So we have these twin sort of uh, milestone and millstones uh, that I've been talking about, uh, sort of a progressive a uh, perspective and then a very regressive perspective. Uh, moving forward, and we're obviously skipping a lot of uh, a, a lot of history. Moving to the 20th century, uh, the um, uh, the only real community in which uh, blacks uh, achieved a degree of equality mm -hmm. within the community uh, was in in uh, Buxton, Iowa, uh, which was a coal mining town near Oskaloosa that was in operation from about 1900 to 1920. But when those coal mining began to seize in Iowa, individuals that lived in those communities began to move to other Iowa communities and learn that uh, that segregation was imposed, if not legally, at least in term or just, uh, at least in terms of uh, of employment. Uh, as well as education. So a series of reports come out in the middle of the 20th century documenting this. This is a cover of one of them that was done in Davenport, uh, Citizen Second Class, and talks about the various ways in which African Americans in the Davenport area are excluded from employment, uh, excluded even from uh, going to a doctor's office or a dentist's office, and talks about the fact that if an African American male man wanted to get a haircut, uh, he had to cross the river uh, into uh, into Illinois in order to be able to get a haircut. There was because there was nobody that could give him or would give him a haircut uh, in Iowa in you know around 1950 or so. So um, and this was documented. These kinds of uh, this kind of evidence was documented in other cities in Iowa, uh, Burlington and Waterloo, as well as Davenport. Nevertheless, there are some progressive things that are happening. Uh, Edna Griffin, who I think many people know who she is, uh, helped to desegregate a lunch counter uh, in the 1940s, uh, again, before uh, lunch counter desegregation was being done in the South in the 1960s. Uh, she successfully uh, was able to uh, fight uh, an attempt to exclude her from getting, I think, ice cream to eat in 1948. Um, and then Anna Mae Weems uh, was an important part of the labor movement in Waterloo uh, that attempted to do a, uh, pr provide opportunity at Rath Packing, one of the city's major employers, for African Americans to work in um, not only not just in the dirtiest jobs in in the meat packing plant, but in other jobs as well. Uh, and so basically obtaining equality of employment opportunity uh, in uh, uh, Rath. Uh, packing. Uh, and so she also is a well-known civil rights uh, uh, pioneer in the state. And then in moving into really the 1960s, uh, the advent uh, of the Black Panthers in, in Des Moines, uh, and here the issue particularly of police relationships, police relations between the Black community and um, uh, 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 and the police comes to the fore, and we know those issues remain with us uh, to this day. Uh, one of the areas in which the federal government re-enters the, the, uh, uh, the situation is with uh, the, the Center Street neighborhood, which is west of downtown. Uh, it was, uh, this was a, uh, a bustling African-American neighborhood with a lot of entertainment uh, and restaurants uh, and uh, jazz clubs and the like. This is a photograph from around 1966. Uh, but urban renewal, and the interstate highway that came through here did what it, it, it did in many communities. Uh, it disrupted African-American communities and forced people to relocate. James Baldwin famously said that urban renewal of the 1960s was basically the real name for it should be Negro removal. Uh, and that is exactly what happened uh, in, uh, in Des Moines. So again, the federal government has a hand in uh, at least relocating and making life, certainly disrupting life, uh, just as it did with uh, Native Americans, now it's doing the same uh, for, um, or aiding local government and doing the same for uh, African Americans. Uh, and this is a, a 
contemporary photograph of what uh, the Center Street area looks like today. It's uh, primarily uh, hospital uh, parking and uh, uh, the stores that were once there, the pharmacy, the, the, the Lena's Beauty Shop that served the black community are, are, are long gone. Uh, the, uh, there's somebody who's quoted as saying that uh, people who lived in Center Street viewed uh, urban renewal as being there or 9-11. And more recently, and when I moved to Iowa City, the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the talk was about people moving to Iowa from Chicago. And it quickly became clear that uh, <clears throat> uh, Chicago was code as Ta-Nehisi Ta Coates said, for black people. Uh, the, uh, and this is partly related to the fact that uh, the Illinois population of African Americans has been declining uh, in the 21st century. And uh, some of the people uh, who, who formerly lived in Chicago are moving to a variety of Iowa cities. So, so there, there was, uh, and still is, a, a degree of tension. I certainly there was when I first moved to Iowa City over people from Chicago and the southeast side. Uh, so again, uh, yes, uh, Iowa is becoming more diverse, but in it was not going very well. Uh, and lastly, before I, I move on to the next part, uh, if you look at uh, a variety of ways of comparing African American and, uh, and whites in Iowa, whether it's uh, incarceration, whether it's arrest, whether it's high school suspensions, whether it's vis visibility in um, the public sector uh, uh, election to, to office. Uh, as far as I know, there are, there are zero black Iowa State Patrol officers. Uh, the, uh, and, and then if we look at, uh, I'll just skip ahead, at a variety of other indicators, college degree, home ownership, poverty, employment, uh, the white to black ratio, that is the degree to which whites do better than blacks, is uh, much higher than Iowa and than in most other states. So the result is, and this is based on a study that Colin Gordon, my colleague, at the history department talks about, uh, Iowa typically falls near the bottom of all states in terms of uh, how blacks fare relative to whites. So even compared to other states, we don't do very well. Um, and I also want to just cite the quote from Nadine Petty, who's no longer at the University of Iowa. This was in from two years ago when she said of the University of Iowa, the status quo here on the, this campus is white. Uh, as I said earlier, it has all the appearances of, of being a, a white place. And, um, uh, and so that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, difficult for uh, African Americans who feel like this is a place that they uh, feel comfortable. And we know most, more recently uh, with the COVID crisis that Latinos and Black Iowans are uh, re uh, 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 disproportionately victimized uh, by the COVID crisis. Um, and to the degree to which you think that Iowa is handling or mishandling the COVID crisis, it's, uh, then its impacts, uh, uh, then, then the degree to which it's mishandling it is having a disproportionate impact on uh, Latino and Black Iowans. Uh, this was confirmed in part by the CDC that looked at meatpacking workers and showed that uh, 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 Hispanic and Black workers uh, were more likely to suffer from um, um, uh, COVID. Uh, interestingly, Iowa chose not to participate in that study. So we don't know exactly how Iowa would fare. Uh, we do know that Iowa suppressed the number of uh, COVID cases in Columbus Junction. It was not 200 or so, it was 500 or so. Um, moving on, and we're, I know we're running out of time. Uh, uh, the, the, in more recent years, there has been a, a significant growth of Hispanic population uh, in the state of Iowa. And this is shown on the, the map on the left, uh, which actually shows growth between 2000 and 2010. Uh, and, and much of the West, not just Iowa, uh, reflects uh, this. And uh, uh, at the same time, many uh, uh, there's been a decline in the white population. This is shown on the right-hand side. So Hispanics moving to uh, Iowa in, in fairly great numbers, as we already talked about. Uh, although they, uh, 
they uh, Hispanics began, and particularly Mexicans began to move to Iowa in the early part of the 20th century. So there were small but significant population clusters, particularly in eastern Iowa, as well as north central Iowa, in connection with the, the uh, uh, harvesting of, uh, of beets. Uh, and then this map shows where the concentration of uh, uh, of uh, 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 the the states uh, 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 slaughterhouse communities, many of which have predominantly Hispanic uh, populations working them, uh, working in often the dirtiest, uh, ill-suited uh, jobs. More recently, uh, Burmese and Congolese have been taking have been uh, uh, taking some of those jobs as well. So. Uh, uh, the transformation of the meatpacking industry has led to uh, uh, the, the, the increased number of Hispanics and now more recently uh, uh, Burmese and Congolese working in these meatpacking towns that are shown here. For the Hispanic community, uh, the uh, again, the federal government has an important role to play, and we know this from the immigration rates that have been an important part of Iowa history in the last, uh, certainly the last 15 years or so, even, even uh, before that, uh, going back to the 1990s. Uh, the most significant raids uh, that are shown here are Marshalltown in 2006, Postville, probably the, well, certainly at that time, the biggest raid ever uh, in 2008, I think something like uh, I don't have the number, 300 uh, were detained and, and many of them were deported uh, of the workers. And then Mount Pleasant more recently, I think it was 32 workers. That was in uh, 2018. So again, the federal government is playing a role primarily through immigration policy in uh, not only uh, trying to deport uh, Hispanic uh, uh, residents of the state, but obviously also very much disrupting their lives, causing a great, great deal of anxiety and uh, concern. And we also know that this has gotten caught up very much with um, uh, presidential politics. And uh, if you look into 2016 uh, and you look at uh, uh, Iowa voters that voted uh, in the Republican caucus, uh, the issue that seemed to motivate them the most of the four issues that are presented here was immigration. Immigration was uh, the, the driving force behind the Republican victories uh, in 2016, both nationally and in Iowa. Uh, and all this comes to really to play with, of course, with two years ago with the, uh, the murder of Molly Tibbetts uh, and the, uh, the quick uh, effort by both President uh, Trump and Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds to uh, blame uh, the death or to pin the death on what they called the broken immigration system. That was a quote from uh, Kim Reynolds. Um, and uh, uh, Tibbetts' alleged murder uh, uh, worked on a uh, dairy farm uh, in Powashi County. Uh, but the, that fact as well sort of re reflects the dilemma uh, for uh, the state of Iowa uh, the uh, many people, as we just said, are opposed to, to immigration, would like to limit immigration, would like to send people back, uh, build a wall, etc. But on the other hand, the state's economy is uh, uh, greatly dependent upon inexpensive labor, uh, both in meatpacking as well as in dairy. And here's a quote at the bottom from Daniel Dykstra, who's a dairy farmer, uh, saying it's kind of monotonous repetitious work, uh, pretty fast uh, pace, smelly, dirty work. Moms don't raise their kids to be milkers. So to get the labor that he thinks he needs at a price that he can afford, probably, uh, he, he hires primarily uh, Mexican and Guatemalan. So this sort of schizoid attitude on the one hand, uh, w we would like them not to be here. We'd like them to go back home. But on the other hand, we need them uh, to work. Uh, and of course, we saw that with the COVID crisis uh, when, uh, Basically, uh, uh, meatpacking workers were told by both the governor and the governor uh, and the president to go back to work, regardless of the safety. And of course, we have Steve King, uh, who uh, is, will finally no longer be congressman for many, many years. Uh, when uh, issues of race in Iowa came up, uh, Steve King was certainly a part of the conversation. And the fact that he continued to be reelected was not something that about which Iowa should be proud. And lastly, I want to briefly mention uh, Asian Americans, of which there are many different um, Asian Americans uh, in Iowa. But in recent years, uh, particularly the Burmese uh, have been moving uh, to Iowa. 
before that, it was the Vietnamese. Uh, again, one of the heroic stories, stories, one of the milestone stories, is the story of Robert Ray reaching out to, to the Thai Dam ethnic group in Vietnam in 1975 when no other governor would do so in inviting them to come to Iowa. The same with the, uh, the, the, the uh, 1,500 Vietnamese uh, boat people who had no place. And then more recently, uh, we have refugees from uh, both Burma and, uh, and Bhutan. Uh, we've done some work in Columbus Junction with some of the Burmese refugees there. Uh, and uh, th many of them had lived previously in refugee camps before they were able to come uh, from, uh, to, to the US. And so they had some very troubled uh, backgrounds. Uh, Iowa State Senator Janet Peterson said, these are by far the neediest refugees we've ever had. Many of them don't understand the concept of public schools and public education. They've never even had running water. Their needs are enormous. Uh, and again, they uh, concentrate primarily in meatpacking towns. Uh, Columbus Junction, and I know another community work we're working this year uh, in uh, is Waterloo, and there is a substantial Burmese population there as well. But again, the federal government gets involved. Um, and we know that in recent years, the Trump administration has tried to reduce the, um, the, the, the cap on the number of refugee admissions to the US. The Burmese and other groups like the Congolese are all admitted under the UN's uh, refugee program, uh, but the Trump administration has greatly reduced uh, the number of refugees that are permitted each year. It was 85,000 under the final, in the final year of the Obama administration. And currently this year, it's down to 18,000 nationally. Plus the Trump administration issued an executive order granting state and local governments the authority to, to reject uh, refugee uh, resettlement as well. So putting the squeeze even on refugees uh, like uh, uh, the Burmese. So, uh, so in summary, yes, Iowa's population is becoming more diverse, but its whiteness was deliberately created and it is not going away easily. Uh, with the assistance of federal treaties, uh, the uh, Iowa is transformed by, from a, uh, a Native American state to a, an Anglo-American, or I should say European-American state. Uh, we had many uh, pioneering court decisions uh, in the 19th and 20th century, but we also had laws that tried to prohibit uh, African-American residency in the state. Uh, the federal government assisted local government efforts in Des Moines to expel uh, African Americans from the, the Center Street District. Uh, we have raids uh, instituted by the federal government and to, to uh, uh, make uh, life in Iowa more difficult for uh, Hispanics. Um, and then lastly, the federal government is uh, trying to put the same pressure really or similar yeah. pressure on refugees as well. So last slide. <laughs> Iowa is becoming a more diverse state. Uh, to participate in a global world and to address its labor shortages, Iowa must become a more diverse state. We need to do so. There is no growth in the white population. It is in the uh, 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 African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians is where our growth is. And so we need to welcome them. We need to think progressively and proactively about the ways in which we become a more diverse state. So I'm going to stop right there. Shall I stop sharing? Sure. Yep. That would be fine. All okay. right. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So now we will move on to a 15 minute Q and A session. Um, <clears throat> so please submit your questions via the chat function. Um, you can access that by clicking on the chat box icon at the bottom of the zoom screen. Um, you can send those to everyone publicly or to Chuck or myself privately. Um, while we wait for questions to come in, I would like to mention that we have lined up a great set of programs for this fall semester. So be sure to join us again um, each week and check our website for the most updated information about future programs. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to clear up a bit of confusion um, regarding receiving the Zoom link each week. So the link is included in the confirmation email you receive immediately after registering for the program. If you lose or don't receive that email for some reason, we also send the link to all registered emails on the morning of each program. So be looking out for that. Um, finally, I want to remind everyone that we are currently welcoming new members to ICFRC. 
If you would like to become a member or renew a lapsed membership, uh, please visit our website at icfrc.org for more information. So with that, we'll move on to the Q&A portion. Okay, who selects the question, you or me? <laughs> um, you know, I'm fine with either way. I guess what we usually do is I'll read them out loud just in case someone's listening by phone. Oh, good um, idea, okay. So let's see, I saw one come in during the, near the end of the program. So Sandra asked, I was told that Waterloo was a destination during the great migration from the South. Is that correct? Uh, yes, um, and actually uh, Water, Waterloo's black population grows significantly between 1910 and 1920, uh, which was the first uh, great migration. Um, and it and it's uh, partly, in fact, a large part of it is related to uh, uh, the Illinois Central Railroad, uh, which had major major yards there uh, and a lot of employment. Um, there was a strike, uh, and uh, most of the employees were white. Uh, and the company uh, brought in uh, African Americans from the South. Uh, and of course, Illinois Central was sort of is a it was the main line to to uh, to the South, and so uh, they brought in uh, African Americans, and so uh, that helped to diversify the city. But it got the city off in terms of its racial relations to a very bad start because uh, African Americans were being used as strike breakers. Okay, great. Um, so. There's a question here that says, I remember hearing about some policy that has made Iowa a place for refugee resettlement. Can you provide any information about that in the current state of that? Yeah, the, the um, um, uh, what I'm, I'm telling you, what I do know is that, that the, certainly the important role that Governor Robert Ray, going back to the 1970s had in this regard, they were really a pioneer in refugee resettlement. Uh, the um, uh, that in terms of state government, uh, I, I certainly think that's much less so. We, we call the uh, Syrian refugees from about five years ago. And that question came up uh, when Branstad, I think, was still governor. Um, and he pretty much said, no, we're not interested in being uh, home to uh, Syrian refugees. Uh, and of course, the, the, the contrast with uh, Governor Ray was pointed out by many at that time. There are, of course, nonprofit organizations, Embark, E-M-B-A-R-Q, -E uh, and I don't remember what that stands for, is an important nonprofit organization. There are other nonprofits that work with refugees. A number of the refugees that come to uh, Iowa, certainly the Burmese, were not initially uh, placed in Iowa. They were placed in cities like Indianapolis and I think Rochester as well. Uh, and there's still the uh, uncertainty, but it, it certainly appears that Tyson recruited them uh, to come to Iowa. Uh, I, I, Tyson hasn't said they did that, but the fact that you have so many Burmese working in, certainly in, in the two that I know of, Columbus Junction uh, and Waterloo, that uh, Tyson plants there strikes me as not a, not a coincidence. Sure. Um, okay, so we have another Question. Well, I guess it's not so much a question as a request, um, <laughs> asking you to comment further on Buxton. Okay. Yeah, Buxton was a, uh, it, and I still don't know why the company, the, the, what was the name of the company? It's a uh, consolidation coal company. That's not quite right. But they, um, uh, they uh, basically paid their, uh, Black workers and their white workers pretty much the same. The white workers were, I think, predominantly Swedish at that time. Uh, the community was pretty flat in terms of there, it wasn't very hierarchical, uh, and it certainly wasn't hierarchical by, by race. Um, and the schools were integrated, and of course, uh, integrated schools was the norm at that time, but they had black teachers. Most of the rest of the state did not hire black teachers. Um, so it was, uh, you know, whether it was paradise or not, uh, I don't know, but uh, certainly the, the, the books, or the key book, particularly by Dorothy Schweider on that, talks about, um, uh, based on interviews with people that lived there and then moved elsewhere uh, in the state, uh, the documents that the, 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 uh, the fact that the, the way that people were treated either in school or employment was not as good 
elsewhere, as, it, uh, as I say, in Cedar Rapids, as it had been uh, in Buxton. So it was, but it was a coal mining town, and we know coal mining eventually played out in Iowa. So it was, uh, uh, once the coal was gone, so was uh, the community. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so a question from Krista is, what groups in Iowa are working on promoting a more progressive attitude to diversifying Iowa, and what strategies are being used? Okay, the, uh, certainly, the, and I'm not always good at remembering names, uh, the groups that are working, uh, there's something called the Eastern Iowa Bond Program that works with people that have been, and families that have been uh, detained and are facing uh, um, uh, expulsion, uh, deportation, I should say. Uh, that, that's one group. Uh, in, here in Iowa City, the uh, um, Center for Worker Justice works with many uh, groups that work in uh, 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 many minority populations that uh, work in situations where they're exploited one way or the other, uh, and so works as their uh, as their advocate. I mentioned in Bark before. I know there is a social service agency as well that works with refugees in Cedar Rapids, and I'm uh, I'm blanking on the name right now. Great. Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, uh, what, let, me, let me just, let me just, I, I, I think, that, you know, I think given back what I was saying, I think it's important for the state of Iowa and for the government of Iowa to embrace refugees uh, and to, it, to do a better job of embracing refugees and, and, and embracing uh, basically a new Iowans. Uh, and that did take place uh, back in the first part of the 21st century and during the Culver administration and um, uh, Vilsack's administration. But we don't see it right now. And especially when the governor is telling people they have to go back to a place where they, they, they'll, they, they could easily catch COVID virus. It sends obviously the, the wrong message in terms of embracing uh, the, you know, the, 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 these people who want to live in Iowa. Absolutely. Um, so I guess going off of that, somebody I guess said the Macaulay Center in Cedar Rapids. Thank you. <laughs> That's the yeah. name I was trying to remember. Thank you. Yeah, there's yeah. some great, um, some great comments in the chat feed um, talking about some of the uh, groups that are working with immigrants and refugees. So feel free to check those out if you're interested. Um, so just expanding on what you were just saying, though, can you um, talk a little bit more about why why you think this kind of growth and acceptance of refugees is important to any state and to Iowa in particular? Well, it's, you know, I, I see this in, uh, in, you know, the classes that I teach uh, in, I teach in the, what we call now the School of Planning and Public Affairs. It's difficult to talk about progress and diversity when 95% of the students in your class are white. Uh, and uh, our, our students, in order to be able to basically not, well, to, to thrive in the world, the, the increasingly diverse world, need to have the experience of doing that throughout their formative years. Uh, and certainly would like to see it in my classes at the University of Iowa. It's, uh, I came here from Florida State University and uh, Florida State did, uh, is, is a, of course Florida is a more diverse state, but Florida State did an exemplary job of increasing, particularly when I was there, the, the number of African Americans. Uh, and so it made it possible for us to have really meaningful conversations. So, uh, you know, I think the state needs in, on various fronts, whether it's higher education or K through 12, uh, you know, a great example of this is the West Liberty K through 12 dual language program, where everybody benefits from being with people of other cultures and ever other backgrounds. Uh, and so people come out with that kind of experience. And I think it's important for them, for the state of Iowa and for those individuals. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question also that asks, is Iowa uniquely stubborn? And are there recent examples of progressive interventions that have occurred in other states? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, the uh, it's um, um, the, the, the <laughs> especially in the Midwest. There's there there is not a lot of you know who 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 do we emulate? In fact, when I was wrapping up the book, I said, "Who can Iowa emulate?" And um, I uh, it was it was a bit of it was a bit of a struggle to, uh, to find that out. So I think really uh, you know Iowa maybe Iowa just has to be the champion. Uh, we need to be the ones that lead the way 
and we've led the way in the past as they talked about those critical court decisions uh, so it's it, it's it you know it, it this is a state that wants to grow its population uh, Iowa was <laughs> this is hard to believe in 1900 Iowa was the 10th largest state in the United States 10th largest state Iowa by 2000 it was the 30th largest state it's now the 31st largest state but we went from 10th to 30th in 100 years no state fell further so we are a state that is desperate for growth who wants to move here people who are uh, people of color want to move here so if we really want to be a state in which we grow and we thrive then we need to do a better job of welcoming welcoming these individuals because they are the future of the state of Iowa. So it's in our interest to do a better job. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so a, a bit of a different topic, but a question here. Um, do you have any stats on farmland ownership by Blacks? And are there any policies that you know of that have made this harder or any movements to help POC own farms? Uh, I don't have any data on that at all. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's got to be pretty uncommon. Uh, I, I've seen photographs, historic photographs of farmers in which there were photographs of black farmers in Iowa, uh, but I don't have that figure in front of me. Uh, I mean, the state was uh, was settled so quickly uh, and uh, the, the black population uh, was so small. What I don't quite understand though, and this is still, uh, I'm still uh, would like to have more information on this. <clears throat> is the concept of sundown towns. And we haven't brought that up. Uh, Illinois is notorious for having sundown towns. That is towns, including the ones that my parents grew up in in Southern, Southern Illinois, in which African-Americans weren't allowed after sunset, you know, hence sundown town. Um, and, um, and so the, the, the book that was written about that, uh, and I'm forgetting the guy's name who wrote the book, it'll come to me. Um, uh, about 15 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, talks a little bit about Iowa, but he doesn't have a lot of evidence about Iowa communities being sundown towns. On the other hand, many of the towns that uh, were the predominant places in which African Americans lived in the 19th century, places like Keokuk, for example, many, uh, uh, m many uh, African Americans moved out of those communities. And so you see a decline in the number of African Americans living in smaller or rural areas in Iowa between the 19th century and the 20th century. Uh, and one example of that that I'm really perplexed about is Newton. Yeah, James Lowen, somebody put that out. James wrote the book, Sundown Towns, thank you. Um, Newton, Iowa had a, uh, a, a graduate student with whom I'm working has documented this, uh, a, a small but significant post-Civil War African-American population. And gradually it declines in number. And it declines in number at the same time that um, Maytag is established as a major manufacturer in Newton. So why is it that African Americans are leaving Newton at the same time that it's the city, the town is becoming industrialized? Uh, I don't really know. So we don't know to the degree to which African Americans were actually forced out of rural areas or whether they chose to leave to go to bigger cities. That's really an unanswered question. That is a very interesting question though. Um, so a question from Art Spizak uh, with the Otters. Um, how does the university's student diversity compare to the states? Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I think, um, I think we're a little better uh, <laughs> than the state uh, of Iowa, uh, but I, <laughs> they're, they're available on the website. <laughs> sure. I'm not sure what they are. I think, you know, we, in our program, in our in our planning program, uh, we you know we do comparisons and uh, we like to compare to the university and to the state. But I'm pretty certain the university is a little better than the state. Certainly, certainly Iowa City is more diverse than uh, than than the state of Iowa uh, is. And so, and I believe the university is as well. But I, I don't have the figures at my. Somebody may post the figures <laughs> if we wait long enough. Yes. Um, well, I would like to take one more question. So um, Linda is asking, have you done any research on Storm Lake in particular and its population shift over the past 30 years as it's become more diverse? 
Well, no, I haven't. Art Cullen has done that job in his book, Storm Lake. <laughs> no, oh, Storm okay. Lake. Yeah, Storm Lake. Storm Lake's an amazing place, and uh, uh, he his, he came out with his book just about two years ago. At this almost to the almost to the day, uh, and uh, you know, he, he he's more of a journalist. I'm more of an academic. So he, uh, so my book is is different in style, and I do talk a bit about Storm Lake. Storm Lake uh, was a meatpacking town. Uh, like Columbus Junction was going back, I think, to the 1930s or so. Uh, and their story is pretty much the same as other meatpacking towns. Uh, in an effort to uh, uh, compete in a highly competitive field, uh, uh, many of these uh, uh, many of these meatpacking companies basically tried to destroy the labor unions. Meatpacking was a middle class profession or occupation in the state of Iowa pretty much until the 1980s and was middle class white occupation pretty much until the 1980s. And the strategy that the meatpacking companies used was to de-skill uh, the labor uh, and so they could pay people less and then to, uh, to break the unions and then to bring people in from the outside, initially from uh, Mexico. Uh, Guatemala and El Salvador, uh, or from uh, Texas and, and California, uh, and then later on refugees. Uh, and so the transformation that's taking place in uh, uh, Storm Lake, of which uh, Art Cullum is very proud and he should be, uh, is uh, one in which uh, this, the, the town is much more diverse than it once was. Uh, but uh, there was a profile, for example, of a uh, one of the workers at the uh, major meatpacking plant there in uh, uh, Storm Lake, who uh, retired, I think, two or three years ago. Uh, and at his retirement, he was making the same hourly wage as he was making in 1981. Uh, oh, wow. And so the impact uh, uh, on these communities in terms of uh, basically the middle class, uh, and that's part of what my book talks about, is yes, we, we are more diverse, but secondly, everybody's getting paid less than they used to be paid. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chuck. This was very fascinating. Um, so to wrap it up, I just want to give a big thank you again to Chuck for the wonderful presentation. Um, thank you to our sponsors for their generous support. And uh, Chuck, I'm honored to virtually present you with our <laughs> coveted ICFRC. Coffee. All right. All right. <laughs> and we will be in touch with how to get that to you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. I'm, I'm just, uh, I got to save the chat here. I want to see what all the, the people know how to do that to save the chat. I, I did save it. So I can send okay. it to you. Sure. Okay, good. All right. Thank you very much. Well, yep. it's my pleasure. I enjoyed it. I was really glad that I didn't go over my allotted time, which is what <laughs> normally happens. It was perfect. All right. So thank you again. Again, um, and everyone that's joining us, thank you. And with that, we will uh, adjourn. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.